Hello everyone. Welcome you all to the TechGeek webinar. Thank you for joining the session today. The topic of today's talk is analytics and user experience go hand in hand. It will be a one hour session with around 40 to 45 minutes for the presentation and the remaining time for the question and answer. So if you have any questions, please send them to us using the questions tab on the GoToWebinar control panel. I am Akriti, the moderator of this session and it gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Neha Modgil from TechWed Consulting, India Private Limited. Neha's passion lies in inventing new and powerful ways to make consumers' digital experience better. She has around 50 plus, 15 plus years of experience into designing and innovation industry. She is a thought leader with a fertile mind and a woman with great passion towards the work. She started her journey as an architect, but her drive towards design and digital world turned her as a woman entrepreneur of TechWed in 2007. Neha is not just face of TechWed, but she is a philanthropist and an idle mother. She has the grace in herself to do something on her own without reliance in another. She is a confident woman and proves that power does not have to come from being loud or brash. So without any further delay, let me over to you, Neha. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a afternoon, raining afternoon today in Bombay, and um, the weather is very moist. Um, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, the topic for today is analytics and user experience go hand in hand. Um, for everybody who joined the last webinar, there's a little bit of a takeaway from there. And for everybody who didn't, I'll do a little snapshot of what we covered in the last webinar before we start with this one. So our last webinar, <coughs> sorry, our last webinar was about user experience and prototyping what you do, going to the users, talking to them, understanding their feedback and making changes basis their feedback. So it was all about field study. Today, what we're going to talk about is analytics and measuring your design. Uh, last webinar was about collecting feedback on your design, which is more qualitative. But today we're going to discuss quantitative measures of design, how analytics plays a very crucial role when it comes to taking design decisions, uh, when, it takes, uh, when it comes to strategizing your digital decisions. And that is largely the topic and the area that we are going to cover today. Let me start with a few examples. I'll show you a few screenshots even before we start talking about analytics and user experience. So this is Amazon. As you see on the left is what Amazon was earlier. And on the right is a screenshot of what it is today. I'll show you another one. Look at Facebook. This is what Facebook was some years ago, and this is on the right what Facebook is today. You have YouTube as an example, what YouTube was and what it is today. And you've got Apple as an example, a classic example of the first iPhone and what it is today. All of this is a dramatic change. If you see all these examples that I've shared with you, they have not just changed in the way they look, they have changed in the way users and consumers experience the product. It has changed drastically from um, what it would have intended to be to what it is today. So if I take you through these again, look at Amazon, started with books and supermarket online. what it was about. It was an online directory that connects people through social networks at colleges. And today it says connect with friends and the world around you on Facebook. How do you think this vast difference happened? Um, or there's YouTube as a good example, or, or the iPhone, and many such examples exist around you. There is somebody taking decisions 
in the background. There is somebody who's deciding what shape is the next product feature going to be? What shape is this product going to be? All of those decisions are based on certain criteria. They cannot always be based on a founder's gut or a product owner's hunch. They have to be based on certain numbers. They have to be based on certain um, findings and insights that you have. And that is where analytics becomes important. That is why it is said digital products are forever iterative. We're forever living in a beta stage. We're always testing something. Gone are the days when you set up a factory and you start manufacturing one dye that is made in the factory lasts you for a couple of years. In the digital world, that doesn't exist. Digital world is extremely iterative. If you make a mistake, it's all right. You just undo it and redo something else. So um, it also gives you a lot of space for forgiveness because you're forever making changes, um, but nevertheless, you're making changes. Now, why is the digital product and why is this ecosystem so iterative? Let's understand the basis of it being so iterative and so fragile. So the foremost thing is that the consumer behaviors are forever changing. What I used to do on the internet a year ago, I don't do that anymore. How I used to work a year ago, I don't work like that anymore. So if I look at my own work environment in our office, things were all on email. Um, every approval was on an email. Um, every design that was created was sent to us on an email and we used to look at it. Um, today it has all changed. Everything has moved to WhatsApp. So designs are sent on WhatsApp. Communication is happening on WhatsApp. We have changed the way we work. And what has that done to our behaviors? It is all symbiotic, right? We, something changes um, our behavior and our behavior changes something in the digital. So it's, it's all a constant give and take. Because of WhatsApp, what has happened is that the consumer's expectation has reduced, the uh, expectation of a turnaround time has reduced to two minutes and instant. You know, a Maggie two minute instant formula has started working everywhere. I need it and I need it right now. So what is what are you doing in your consumer journeys that is gratifying the user or you know telling him that he will get it instantly is what you guys have to start thinking so consumer behaviors are in that sense forever changing not just consumer behaviors that are changing the technology is dynamic what was there yesterday is obsolete today so if you look at mobile development there are new technologies like flutter that have come up which have which are far more superior than other technologies they are faster they are they can they can take very very heavy files they can compress them they have better compilers so the technology itself is forever changing and now we're not even talking of mobile apps we're now talking of iot and uh, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality so this change in technology is also one of the reasons why digital products get so iterated Along with that, there are newer business objectives that keep coming in. So if an objective yesterday was, I need a better conversion rate on my website. Today, when I start getting the conversion rate, the objective changes to, I need to increase the wallet share on the website. So if the person was spending you know, $100 on an average on, on the cart, I now want to increase it to $150. So how do I start upselling? And how do I start cross-selling products? So the objectives are forever changing, which leads to change in the products then. The way you look at the products, or the uh, focus shifts. Then there are evolving business metrics. What you used to measure yesterday is perhaps what you, is different from what you measure today in your business. If in a matrimonial site, I was measuring number of profiles yesterday, today probably I'm also measuring how many people contacted how many people. How fast was an answer received to a contact that was made? So the measurement of business has changed as well, which leads to digital products being in this iterative mode. If they are in this iterative mode, then it's all the more important that you have tools to measure the iteration. Every time you make an iteration, you should be able to measure the performance of the iteration and be able to make your next iteration basis the performance metrics that you have for yourself. And that is what we are largely going to cover today. Now, since we said that, you know, everything is changing and we said that there are four changing things as consumer behavior, technology, business objectives and metrics that are changing. Probably the last three are not under a UX designer's prerogative. 
he's not looking at the last three, but he's definitely looking at changing consumer behaviors. And when I say changing consumer behaviors, I mean many, many things like what you see on the slide today. His language may be changing or, or maybe his language is not changing, but you are penetrating to a tier two and a tier three now. So you need to look at newer languages on your interface. Uh, people in tier two, tier three are acquiring, for example, basic English. So should your interface now be English or should it be Hindi or should it be a English where um, you start thinking of how he talks and hence your interface should also talk in the same language. Uh, the time of the day, the weather of, uh, in which he browses your app, um, the devices, the channel preferences, the locations from where he uh, looks at your app. Every website um, till two years ago was looked at from an office environment or a house environment, which was no static environment. Not two, maybe four years ago. But in the last four years, with the way the mobile has penetrated, every digital asset is being looked at on the go. So is your product good enough and amicable enough to be looked at in every light condition? Can I, on a uh, mobile train, when I'm swinging with one hand holding the rod, I'm still with the other hand browsing my mobile, is your app favorable in that condition? And hence, since the location is changing, you need to see where, what location is your app getting or your product getting access from and make it friendly to that location. Um, past behaviors of people have to be recorded because more and more uh, increasingly people are expecting personalization on products, which means that they expect that you know the purchase history, you know their behaviors, you know their business life, you know their personal life. The millennials of the world don't mind sharing their personal information on social. They expect you to know it and address them accordingly. So in this environment, it's a very dynamic, ever-changing environment. How equipped are you to study that behavior and be able to make your next iteration and your next digital move in the correct direction? And hence, uh, all of the tools and all of the methodologies to study consumer behavior become very important. I've listed certain methodologies that can be used. There are reviews and ratings. I had spoken about some of them in my last webinar last week. Um, there are reviews and ratings. There are online feedback forms. There are conversion funnel tracking, dropouts, bounce rates, contextual studies, usability tests, eye tracking. There are various methodologies. There are just some of them. Ones that are listed here are the top ones and the popular ones that we offer as well. Now, uh, the difference between them is that some of them are quantitative data and some of them are qualitative data. You need to be conscious when to collect quantitative data. Quantitative data is data you collect from a large number of people where the quantity is very high. And qualitative data is the data that you collect with a smaller sample set. Today, we are going to emphasize more on quantitative data and that too, using tools which help in analytics. Um, okay, so just moving on. What's the difference between quantitative and qualitative? Let's understand that before we move to quantitative or qualitative uh, data, methodology and tools. Quantitative is largely used when you're discovering facts. So I want to know the trend of user behavior. I want to know the dropouts. I want to know how many people actually move from one page to the other is when I would do a quantitative or an analytics driven methodology. Uh, if I want to know behavior, if I want to know why did people drop out? What, what went wrong? Why did they not submit this form? is when I would do a qualitative. When I want a numerical comparison, when I want numbers to justify what I'm doing, uh, numbers to back what I'm doing is when I would do quantitative. When I want themes to be identified for, by users, which means that, do you like this one or do you like this one? Why do you like this one versus this one? Even before you get into a development cycle, you may have a lot of arguments and frictions between teams saying, no, this design is good versus this design is good. The best way is to just do a qualitative study, take it out to 10 users, 15 users. Let them give an opinion of which one they thought was right. Of course, the people that you choose are going to be the right people according to your profiles, etc. We had spoken uh, a great deal about it in the last webinar, so I'm not going to repeat that. 
Um, also, the insights that you get from a quantitative study or an analytics based study uh, is, you know, this behavior is prevalent, but is prevalent in 20% of the crowd. The 80% is okay with it. So you get a number, you put a number behind the behavior, the percentage of people behaving in a certain way. So 80% people, for example, trust my website, 20% don't, I will probably live with that 20%, is how you start looking at your website once you have analytics data. Um, qualitative study will tell you what is it in those 20 people which makes them distrust your website. So that is how quantitative and qualitative will differ when you start going and deep diving into which methodology to choose to get the consumer insights. Now, like I said, today's webinar is going to be about qualitative and about analytics. Let's talk more about analytics then. We understood what quantitative is, we understood what qualitative is and why quantitative and qualitative at different points of your decision making are important. Let's understand why is, how does qualitative help? How do analytics help? What happens is when you're taking design decisions and all of us must have faced a lot of these situations where uh, to justify a certain design when backed with numbers saying that, you know, when we did an alpha beta and we found that 80% people were able to convert on this design versus this design, you just have a stronger uh, upper hand in the room. You're able to take a more informed decision. Um, the metrics are also more black and white rather than a gut feeling, rather than a product owner saying, I think this is the right way to do it. The data says what is the right way to do it. And there are fewer arguments and your uh, designs reach the light of the day much sooner than uh, you know you would imagine. Otherwise, we've all seen designs getting stuck in meetings and arguments and not really reaching, uh, getting over an approval cycle. So analytics plays a very, very important role over there, but that's internal. Uh, how does it externally help you in a better performance from your digital product? It gives you much faster results. So if I was to do a qualitative study, I would still you know, go to users, find users, go to them, uh, ask a few questions, come back, do my analysis. It's a longer cycle. But if you do an alpha beta testing, for example, or if you have tools like Hotjar or Crazy Egg or you know, there are many tools in the market which you have enabled on your web product. You'd be able to see what's happening and take a decision maybe the next day because it's giving you insights from real users who are using your website. Where are they seeing? Where are they scrolling? Uh, what's going on with them? You can also do continuous monitoring. So I can study the real data, the real users' insights and behaviors on my website uh, actually every day, uh, every hour if I want to. So that's, you can also earmark and say that, you know, I want to see weekend behavior. You can do that. Or I want to see a morning evening behavior. You could also do that. So a continuous monitoring of what's happening. If you're running a campaign and want to see it only during that duration, you can also do that. So a continuous monitoring on certain parameters is uh, also possible. It, uh, like I said, better persuade data oriented stakeholders, people who are uh, internally or externally uh, looking for data. It helps to also justify your decisions to them. It has easier longitudinal studies. Um, what does that mean? It means that across a time duration, you would be able to compare. You'd be able to say, you know, about six months ago, this is how we performed. With these three changes across six months, this is how we now perform. So you can take a much larger time duration and compare your digital products from what it did last year to what it is doing this year. So, uh, and the effectiveness of design changes in those six months can also be helpful. Now, why is this important? This is also important because if you look at very large websites, uh, a travel website or an e-commerce website, they would shy away from making a complete overhaul overnight because there are a lot of risks at stake. There are a lot of consumers who are used to a certain way of browsing on the website. They wouldn't want to overnight change it. In fact, there is a case study where Google changed its blue button of search. Whatever they wanted in the end, they took about a few months to change it. They kept changing it to shades that got them to the final shape. 
So it's always a good idea to make incremental changes knowing your final product. So if I know that my final product is going to look like a certain shape, I would phase it out and I would say, okay, incrementally as baby step, this is how I would go about making that change, knowing that finally I'm going to achieve that design, which means that incrementally measuring each change also becomes important. And that is what is meant by a longitudinal study, a larger time duration spread study is possible if you've got your analytics and metrics uh, measurement of design in place. I'm going to show you a few examples where this will be uh, more evident. These are some examples of our clients where metrics have helped us take certain decisions. Um, I'd be happy if you can ask me questions on these later when we open for the question and answer round. If you look at this, this is a screenshot of Google Analytics. You can see this was a website which uh, is in the area of consulting. Uh, they, what would be important as metrics for them on the website is uh, lead collection. So they would generate leads on the website and would some call center would call them and give them consulting services. If you look at these numbers, um, as a UX designer, it's pertinent. I, I'm not sure of the profiles of most of you who joined here. But for a UX designer, it is pertinent today to start reading these numbers and making sense of it, understanding how the behaviors are uh, impacted and what these numbers mean to you as a designer. So if you look at these numbers, there are, uh, this is um, numbers for a week. There are 10,095 sessions, 27,788 page views. Uh, number of sessions per user are 1.45, which means on an average per user is coming 1.45 times in a week, which means that he's come maybe twice. Uh, number of pages per session are 2.75. That means that he is on an average looking at about 2.5 to 3 pages uh, every time he comes. And the average session duration, which means that on an average, he spends three minutes, four seconds, uh, 0.4 seconds actually, on, uh, on the website. Now, this number by any regard is not a good number. There are benchmarks available for each domain which you could look up. Now, we knew that for the client, the pages that were important are what are listed on the right, the home page about us, our offering, contact us, and recent work, because that is how they did business. These were the most important pages for them. And then we put the analytics on these pages. What did this number tell us? It definitely told us that there was no engagement on the website. The uh, duration spent was only three minutes. Well, the benchmark for a similar site would be about five minutes. So what do we do on these pages? which will help us increase that engagement. The other thing it told us is that people are only looking at about two to three pages. We also saw behavior analytics, uh, behavior funnels in Google Analytics to see which are those pages. And uh, interestingly, the five pages that the business thought were important, it was none of those pages that they were looking at. They were looking at blogs or you know, they were looking at some other pages, which meant that what the business thought was important was not what the user thought was important, which also meant that the pages that were very secondary according to business, but were highly visited by users, had to be re-looked at and engagement had to be built on those pages to increase my number, uh, the time being spent on those pages. So we picked up the pages, those pages in priority and started working on those to increase engagement on those pages. Nevertheless, since the five pages listed on the right were important from a business standpoint, we also started looking at what is it on these pages which will get the consumers on these pages because finally the lead generation was happening from these pages. So uh, the strategies of design or UX can only happen once you know these numbers, you know what's happening, uh, which pages are getting traction, which are not, where are the bounces, um, what's the average time being spent. So that was uh, one of the things that we understood with this client. I will show you another example. Uh, this is a video. So there are tools like, you know, uh, which are available where you can actually record the videos to see the real time session of the user. This is for a hotel website, another client of ours. I'm going to play this video for you guys. Um, let me play the video and then talk about it a little more. 
Okay, I'm playing the video. This is a, like I said, a hot jar video. Um, when you, whatever you see in yellow is where the cursor will move the yellow circle. The orange line is the mouse trail of the cursor. And you may, I don't know the sound systems, but you may also hear a click, which will tell you where the user actually clicked as he moved his cursor. So let me play this. If you notice, there was an interesting thing that the user was trying to do. He wanted to compare the hotels. All the while, he kept thinking that the compare was a link. If you heard the click sound, he was constantly clicking on the compare, where, uh, the text compare, thinking it's a link and wanting to be able to compare hotels by clicking on that compare link. It was much later that he noticed there is a checkbox. And this is one user. We usually watch like hundreds of these videos before we even start drawing insights or start saying this is a trend or this is the finding. And this was a common behavior that we saw in many videos where we saw that he was constantly clicking on the compare, thinking it could be compared. Now, if I was to tell a designer, a UI designer that, you know, that checkbox is not visible to users, he wouldn't believe it. He would probably argue saying it's right next to compare. How can somebody miss it? But we, all of us actually saw in the video what the user did. He did not click the checkbox. He did not even think it was clickable. He kept clicking the compare link, wanting to be able to compare. And these are the kind of insights that you get when you start looking at tools like Hotjar or any video recording tool. There's Lucky Orange and there are many more. Let me show you another video, which will, which is again very interesting. where the video screenshot is not uh, loading. I, there's a blank screen for some reason. Let me just refresh it in a minute. Yeah, okay. The user is at the footer right now. Wait, I'm just, I think we missed it in the back. Just gonna go back a little. With this, we just fixing this video for some reason it's not running till that time we'll just uh, i'll stop this and show you another example we'll come back to this video in a minute okay i'm just going to try it once again Okay, yeah, you can see it now. This was a short one. Let me just play this again. Yeah, so you'll notice that when the user's cursor moves, he tries clicking on the image and, he, and a lot of users tried that. They thought that the image was clickable. It was only later when he clicked on the gallery icon on the top right. Um, and understood that it is the gallery which he has to click to see more pictures. Now, this is a very mobile behavior which he has adapted and has started displaying on the desktop. On the mobile, we just click on the picture uh, and the picture becomes zooms and we see more options of pictures. And many users try doing that. They try clicking on the picture, thinking that the picture card itself is clickable or uh, did not realize that on the top right, there is a gallery icon. He'll have to click on that to get access to many pictures.
So again, another insight which we got from the videos that we saw. And when this insight gets repeated across 100 videos, then you know that you know it's a strong point that you need to put across to your UI guys or the product team or whichever team you're dealing with. Um, let me show you some more examples which are equally interesting. Yeah. Um, now look at this heat map. This heat map is from another tool called Trezier. Um, what does a heat map tell? A heat map is basically telling you that where did the user click a lot and where did he not click? So uh, wherever there is a red or an orange means that the heat is high, which means that the user clicked a lot and where it, wherever it is blue, it means that it is cold area. The user did not click. Now you see this, uh, on the right, a heat map of the page, which is on the left. What does this tell us? This page has, uh, if you look on the left, there are two calendar uh, things, check in and check out, October 31st to November 3rd. Now, uh, if you look at the heat map now, the red circles or the orange circles are on the arrows which means that the user wanted to click on the arrows thinking they are clickable and he thought that the dates could change from there. The actual interaction does not work like that. The arrows are not clickable. The arrows actually don't do anything. The numbers click are clickable. So, um, so this was an interesting insight that, you know, what the user is clicking is not actually clickable. What is clickable is something else. So uh, we'll move to another insight. Yeah, so we'll move on. Uh, so these are some interesting insights that you can get if you are uh, covering analytics in your design process and if you're taking decision basis the analytics. Now let's look at how to measure using analytics. So we've understood what is analytics, we've understood the importance of it, but how do you measure? So even if you agree to me with me that you know analytics is important, it's also important to know how do you start using it now within your organizations. The first thing that you need to do is, if you don't already have one, create a measurement plan. A me measurement plan should consist of goals and conversion goals, and there could be Macro goals, there could be larger goals. You should cover the big picture goals and the macro goals, uh, both of them, because both are important from an organization standpoint. To give you an example, um, a goal could be that I want leads to be generated. And a micro goal could be that I want, uh, so the leads that are generated, I want that within those leads, um, I should have, you know, calls of this percentage, call leads to be of this percentage, and um, email leads to be of this percentage. So you're further, further bifurcating or dividing your bigger goals. So that could be one example of a macro goal. Uh, there could be many other examples of goals and macro goals, but first list them down. That what makes your site successful. And with that, you list down what are the desirable uh, actions that you need to do. Let me show you an example of how we do it. This is an example, a template of um, creating goals and macro goals. On the left, the first column is goals. For example, 50 consulting leads per month is what I need as goals. Next to that, you should write down what are the desirable actions by the site visitors for 50 consulting leads to be achieved. They should visit the consulting service section. They should read about consulting services. They should download white papers, enter data. All of that are actions that the visitors should do for me to be able to meet that goal. Next to that is okay, which means what is it that I need to measure? I need to measure the unique page views, like how many are the page views on that site? What is the average time on the page, which will tell me if they're reading or not? And I need to track events, whether they downloaded the white paper, whether they filled in the form. So I need all of these metrics to be able to achieve or to measure the goal of 50 consulting leads are being achieved or not. This is how you start measuring 
uh, using analytics data. And this is what I strongly recommend all of you to go back and make. It will help you get clarity on um, what is it that you're doing and how do you want to measure it? What is it that you want to measure and how is it that you propose measuring it? Let me show you some things that I recommend that you should be measuring depending on the domain that you're on. An e-commerce may vary from a fintech, may vary from a healthcare. Uh, you should measure the, and these are all from Google Analytics. These are, this is wealth of data that you should measure. You should measure the track conversion parts, which are there in the behavior. If you go to behavior and look at behavior flows, it tells a lot deal about how is your user's behavior going? And this defines your funnel later. Interestingly, you should also track the reverse conversion path. So the track conversion path tells you how the behaviors for the user's forward movement is. Reverse conversion path tells you the user's reverse movement. So it tells you if a person converted from here, where did he really come from? So that you can start looking at where he came from and making it even better. So a reverse conversion path may be equally important. You should also measure the destination URL, which will tell various pages. And on pages, you should have buttons that you should measure. Um, and instead of top events, you know, people usually measure top events. I recommend um, measuring pages and in pages, buttons. So if you look at this data, it tells you within behavior, this event and the top event was this button. So it basically tells you the page, the behavior on the page, which if, whichever events you put for tracking, what are the top events and what is happening to those top events that you have marked on your website as important events. Now events could be banners, they could be buttons, they could be links, um, there could be a variety of events within your website which you need to recognize and identify in your website. Um, create effective UX design using uh, analytics. It can start helping you in monitoring the health of your website like i said in identifying goals monitoring goals and achieving those goals it can help in identification of an issue also a goal is a very large goal sometimes there's a minor issue which if you fix can actually go a great deal in achieving the goal so those minor issues in fact i strongly recommend even if you don't have issues just uh, regularly keep looking at videos of people using your website keep look keep looking at heat maps of your website it tells you a lot about what's happening with your website. It also gives you a free hand in experimentation. If you want to do an alpha beta testing, if you want to just run two variants of your design, it gives you that flexibility. And it of course helps you in meeting certain project objectives that you would have in a certain product. These are some analytics tools that we use uh, largely. I've listed them down for people. Um, these are good tools. Uh, I'm not endorsing any tool, but these are tools that I've used and found good results. And hence, I've just listed them down for everyone to know. For web analytics, there's Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, there's Kissmetrics. All of them are almost in the similar space, but give you certain different ways in which you can slice and dice your data. And they may have different visualizations of your data. There are heat map analytics tools, Hotjar, Crazy Egg, Lucky Orange. Crazy Egg is just one of my favorite tools. Uh, there's real-time analytics, which is clicky, flink. Then there are session recording tools, inspect, like, look back. I'm not saying these are the only tools. There are many more tools available. Uh, session recording, for example, is also done by Hotjar and Lucky Orange. If you could just try them, try any tool that meets your needs, just fix and, uh, stick to that one. Now, there are certain things to keep in mind, and it's important that before I end, I also caution with things that can go wrong when you're measuring analytics data and what you need to keep in mind when you're looking at your data. Ensure that your data is statistically significant. Don't look at five videos and conclude anything. Don't look at five heat maps and say, this is how I think my consumer behaves. That may not be the right way of looking at it. Uh, ensure that you've looked at statistically significant data. We usually look at a sample size of 150 to 200 before we even start concluding anything. So ensure that you've looked at a significant data. It needs a lot of patience, I completely understand, but we as UX designers anyways need a lot of patience. Um, segment your results. So by segmenting results, I mean that you should look at data at different times, at different days of the week. 
Look at data across Mondays, across weekdays, across evenings, across mornings, across locations, across genders, mobile devices. Look, don't look at the entire data as one data. Segment your data and see, okay, let me segment this data into a tier one and a tier two or a metro and a tier two or India and outside of India or a mobile device um, of an Android versus an iOS. Segment your data and look at it. Don't look at it as one universe because it is never one universe. A certain set of profiles may be behaving very, very differently from a different set of profiles. Compare like to like. You can't compare apples to oranges. So if you're doing, for example, an alpha beta, don't have two designs that are completely different from each other. Have two designs that have little variance in them or little variations in them. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to come back and compare the two results. You wouldn't be able to know why one design performed better than the other design. So have variations and compare likes to likes when you're comparing two different designs using any of these tools. Um, also limit the effect of other variables. There may be many variables which may be uh, playing when it comes to metrics. It's not just the UX design. There is, um, you know, what is your competition doing at that time? Maybe they're running an offer which is better than your product pricing. Or uh, maybe that hotel is running a campaign which is better than your hotel. Um, maybe your technology was down at that time. Um, maybe your server couldn't take the uh, load that it got. Um, or there could be an SEO playing into play. You know, the SEO was better of somebody else than yours. Or it could just be a bad day because of many other reasons. You need to consider all of that when you're taking a decision. A decision is not just because the analytics said a certain thing. It could be many other factors which you should bundle up and look at more holistically than looking at only your analytics data and concluding anything. Yeah, so that was the uh, webinar on analytics, why it's important, how it's to be done. Uh, we're open for questions now. If you have questions, please write in to me. I would try and take as many questions as I can in 15 minutes that we have now. If I'm not able to take any questions, my apologies, you could write to me. Um, there is an email ID that is that you can see on the screen. Thank you, Neha, for the insightful presentation. You may take up the questions now. They are displaying in the question panel. Okay, so let me just start going through these questions. Uh, Okay, so there's a question from Sohil, which is what are the best tools available for quantitative and qualitative analytics? Uh, Sohil, I have already covered some tools available for uh, quantitative analytics. For qualitative analytics, there are many tools. The foremost tool is your own observation and your own, because you as an observer would be sitting there when there is qualitative, observing the use, consumer's facial expressions, his body language, what did he say? And you have many other tools which we use here, uh, which you could later use for your analysis. For example, More. More is a tool that we use for recording uh, because later we come back and look at that recording. And uh, we also use More for uh, flagging things on the go as an observer if you want to flag anything uh, or we want to take our notes real time. We also use eye tracking tools uh, in our qualitative studies where we can track the eyes. There are brain mapping tools. So it depends on what kind of qualitative study that you're doing. Basis that the tools may vary. Uh, so Hale has another question. What are the tools to generate heat maps? Uh, like I said, I have already again spoken about it. Uh, Crazy Egg, Lucky Orange, um, Hot Jar. These are tools that give you heat maps and they give you very reliable data on heat maps. Um, Anamrita has a question. How do you choose the tool for analysis of a certain set of data? What is the criteria when there are so many tools available? Anamrita, that's an interesting question and that's a good dilemma to be in. There are many tools available. Like I said, you need to experiment with these tools, put your metrics in them and just see what fits your domain. I would have answered this better if you had told me what is the domain that you're in uh, I would have been able to tell you what is the best one in my experience in that domain that has worked. And if better still, if you can write to me, what are the success metrics for your product? I would be able to recommend a tool which will work best for you. 
Um, I have an interesting question from Rahul. Uh, I research uh, of data science recruitment for refresher. I have seen not much opportunities are there. Is that true or not? I'm a data science student and I fear. Uh, Rahul, there is nothing to fear. There are many opportunities out there. If you're the best, you've got many opportunities anyway. Just put your passion. If you've got a passion for it, just put your heart into it. I'm sure you'll reach the top. Um, Anand has a question. What is A-B testing? Yeah, I did not cover what was A-B testing. Um, Anand, A-B testing, or it's called an alpha beta testing, is a testing methodology that we use when we have two designs. Um, if you have, for example, a doubt on which design will work better, or you have a conflict internally on which design would work better, or you just want to show two designs to your users, what you can do is you can decide the profile of the users. You can say, okay, on, for one week, I am going to show all the uh, Metro people who are coming on my site through an Android device, um, say whoever is coming, 5% of that, I'm going to show my new design and I would measure my success criteria by showing that design. So you would be able to see that with your new design or with your changed design, how did those people perform? Um, so instead of taking a risk of going and changing the design for 100% of the users, you may change it for 5% of users and do an alpha beta. Or, you know, if you have, for example, um, you have sites that are, uh, you've got different varieties of your site. Uh, for example, I know of Bharat Matrimony. Uh, what they did was they have many matrimony sites. They've got an Assam matrimony and a Kolkata matrimony and Punjabi matrimony. They've got 20 something matrimony sites. So wherever their traffic would be lesser, they would uh, do a change in design over there to test the results before they release it to uh, everybody else. So these kind of design variations that you test with users real time and measure the success are called an alpha beta design testing. Um, how do we check uh, page specific or component specific analytics? This is from Zenab Shabir. Zenab, I covered this in one of the analytics slides. You can put an event tracker. An event tracker helps you to track events on the site. And that event could be any component or uh, on your page. Um, Garima Jain has a question. How do you gain more knowledge on analytics UX? Uh, Garima, the best way to achieve knowledge in this field is by working with a mentor. If you want to more, know, know more about this field, no amount of uh, academic knowledge can really help you. You have to actually get your hands dirty and get practical knowledge for which you have to intern or work with a mentor and start looking at data with a mentor and start learning from them. So if you deep dive into a project and start looking at analytics data, make some mistakes. It's okay to make some mistakes. That's how you would learn better. Um, Sanjay has a question. I've got many questions and I'm again apologizing if I can't take up your question. I'm just going one by one. Um, what UX designers need to do if there are no conversions on the page? I hope just changing things, placements is not a good way to do. Sanjay, I agree with you. It's a very bad situation to be in if there are no conversions on the page. Uh, what you need to do first, no conversions is what analytics has told you. What you need to do is meet your consumers and understand why there are no conversions. Now, there could be no conversions, not because of a UX designer's fault. Maybe the service quality itself is not good. So if, for example, Flipkart doesn't uh, deliver to you on time, the conversions will start dipping, right? So this, which has nothing to do with the UX design, it's the service quality. So you need to deep dive and first understand what is the reason for a, a low or zero conversion, which can happen if you do quantitative studies, field study, meet your users, do surveys, do some kind of meeting your users. Maybe just call up your users who come on your site and bounce off and understand why the conversions are low before you can take a call on, you know, what to do next. Um, now I'm just reading the next question that I should pick up. We have another eight, nine minutes to answer more questions. Uh, before getting any analytics from the website, we need to first bring traffic to the website. Can you please tell me how to bring traffic? 
Uh, Shil, today's session was more about how to measure the success of a website, how to measure conversions of your website. It was less about getting traffic to your website. Getting traffic to your website will probably be some other session. Uh, but it's uh, also a digital marketer's job and an SEO and an SEM campaign runner's job more than a UX designer's job to get the traffic on the website. They should be accountable for getting more people on the website. Converting those people is going to be, uh, if you're a UX designer, your job. Um, then I have some repetitive questions which I'm not going to pick up. Priya Nalang has asked a question. Please tell us the resources to study or read which can help decide on metrics which should be considered to take any design or development decision. Um, Priya, this is going to be a call of your business. You need to sit with your business. Uh, not sure what, um, where you are, where if you're working or you have your own startup. If you have your own startup, you need to think what is business for you? And then how do you define that business digitally on your product? Uh, for an e-commerce site, the business analytics could be uh, the cart abandonment ratio, they want to reduce what is the number of cart abandonments, they want to see what is the cart size, what is on an average the amount that the consumer is spending when they're on an e-commerce site. They may want to see the number of products that the person is buying together. Is he buying one or two or five products? He may want to see how much of bundling is he doing uh, or how much of cross-sell is uh, he able, the business able to do. For a, a matrimonial site, it may be very different. For a matrimonial site, it may be how many connections does a, uh, is a, or even for a dating site, how many connections is a user able to do? Uh, how fast is he able to get a revert, revert on the connection request that he had sent? Um, so the metrics purely depend on uh, what is the business that you are in. You will have to first define your business success criteria, which will automatically define your website or your digital product success criteria. Um, Shilp has also asked, do you need any kind of programming for UI UX design or testing? Uh, Shilp, you don't need a technical programming skill. You probably need a brain programming skill. Your brain needs to be very attentive and you need to be very observant to what you're doing and very sensitive to your consumer's needs. Um, you don't really need any additional programming skills to be able to do this. Um, then we have a Veer Sundar. This question is, uh, may I know which tool would sound good for a point of sale machine, which does not have a screen size more than 2.5 uh, feet by 2.5 feet or inches? I'm not sure because two feet, five inches. Okay, I understand. Two feet, five inches by two feet, five inches, I think is what you're trying to say. Uh, for a point of sale machine, there are analytics tools which are now available. Uh, and I'm assuming and uh, believing that your point of sale machine does not have an internet connection or may or may not have an internet connection. And hence, none of the internet based tools will be uh, working for you. There are analytics tools which are uh, which can be built within uh, a non internet connected machine. Also, you could write your own MIS and your own analytics uh, softwares, which you can then map to your point of sale software and they can start collecting metrics data for you. Um, I'm just checking more questions. I have a very basic question from Bridgesh Bish, but I would want to pick this up. It says, can you please explain UX? So um, Bridgesh UX is user experience. Um, if I would want to explain this to you, it's the experience that you have when you go to use an ATM machine. Um, when you first went to use an ATM machine, you probably did not need a manual. No 